Hi everyone, welcome to vlog to welcome to Vlogmas day six. I knew I was gonna do that at some point. Today I am going to be answering some of your questions. But first, before we get into that, uh, a couple things. I will tell you kind of what I'm doing today. Today's Friday, and Fridays Lucy goes to her grandparents' house. So pretty much she goes to her grandparents' house Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of every week. And Mondays and Wednesdays I work at my day job, day job. And then Fridays I work <laughs> at my internet job, I guess. So that's the Fridays is when I do Moonstone Dye Works, and it's also when I do podcast stuff. So um, today is normally a podcast day for me. I do the podcast every other week, but I took last week off, meaning I took Friday off because it was the day after Thanksgiving and it felt like it. So I didn't dye any yarn last week, so I'm gonna dye some extra yarn today, which means I'm not gonna have time to do the podcast, which is fine because you know, blah, vlogmas. But uh, so I'm gonna dye my Christmas colorway today. So every year I like to dye kind of either a Christmas colorway or Christmas colorway plus just kind of a general wintry themed colorway. And, uh, I, I'm kind of, uh, I do this every single year. I wait until, like, it's already December to do it. So I know a lot of people already have their Christmas yarn because dyers come out with their Christmas yarn in plenty of time for people to get it and, you know, start planning their Christmas stuff. But I kind of always wait till the last minute. And I don't want to do that. I do, but I just do. So I'm doing a new Christmas colorway today. And I'm pretty excited about it. And yeah, so that's what I'm doing today. And I'm also going to be doing some vloggy stuff. And I also wanted to tell you something super, super duper duper cool um, that happened to my husband, Colin. Uh, so around here in the town that I live in, we have a weekly rag called the North Coast Journal. It's um it's a free weekly newspaper like publication and it's like an an arts and culture and entertainment kind of thing where they do they write articles of local interest and there's like a food section and then there's like a calendar and like a nightlife section and blah blah blah. Anyway every year they put on a flash fiction contest where you can send in short stories that are 99 words or less and uh colin uh he's a writer and he enters every year and he's been uh published almost every year that he's entered but the, the way they do it is they choose one winner and then like kind of a bunch of like finalists and they publish the winner's story and all the finalists stories they probably i don't know how many entries they get but they probably get a lot of entries and usually i think maybe around 10 stories actually make it into the paper every year so he's he usually makes it into the finalists thing, but this year he won. Uh, he submitted three stories. You're allowed to submit up to three stories. And his story called The Grand Canyon won. And I am just so excited about this that I wanted to share it with you. And if you're interested in reading it, you should go read it. I'm going to totally break my Vlogmas rule, and I'm going to put a link in the description box below to the North Coast Journal, to the section where his story is published. It's a print publication, but they also have a website. And the cool thing about the website is that they actually uh, narrated the stories. So there's a section, if you go there, you can read it online, but you can also click on like the audio file. And they had one of their editors read it, and she reads it really well. She actually reads it better than I read it in my head. So uh, I just thought that was really cool and I'm super excited. So I'm going to put a link down below in case you're interested in reading The Grand Canyon by Colin Trujillo, a prize winning story. They did send him a prize, but they didn't tell him what it was. They told him it was a small prize. So I'm, I have my fingers crossed for restaurant gift certificate. Okay, that's that. Okay, so now... I am going to check out what uh, some of these questions are, and let's get to answering. Okay. Woolen Witch, hi Nina, says, when did you start dyeing yarn? And I believe the answer to that question 
is two years ago or three years ago. I think it's two years ago. So I started this podcast in December of actually, let me check. My show notes are a historical record of all things Squirrel Pie Productions and Moonstone Die Works. So I started this podcast, episode one was, that was fake episode one. So FYI, I started this podcast like in a really nervous state, like I really, really, I had been wanting to start a podcast for years and it was so nerve wracking to me that I didn't know how to do it. And I thought I was not technologically advanced enough to be able to do it. So what I did is my first episodes were recorded on the front facing camera of my computer. And uh, one day I just did it. I was just like, I'm just going to see how this goes. And I just like kind of like did a mock podcast and I recorded it. And uh, it was just kind of my practice run. And uh, I never published it. It was just kind of for me to see like, do I like doing this? Is it gonna look totally stupid? Um, and I did it and I watched it and then I deleted it. And then a couple months later, I did my real first episode that I actually published. And uh, December 2016 is when I first started the podcast. So this month is my podiversary, 16, 17, 18, three years ago. I've been doing this podcast for three years which means I've been dying also for about three years because uh, for Christmas that same December, my mom got me my first dye equipment. Uh, it, it was something that I had been wanting to do and she wanted to encourage me to go for it. Um, so she bought me my first set of dyes and that's it. I got a pot from a thrift store and with that first set of dyes, pot from the thrift store and some practice yarn, I just started dyeing. And I showed it on the podcast in the very early episodes and then eventually I opened the shop. So I have been dyeing yarn for three years. Jillian of Good Witch Knits wants to know what my favorite movie is. That's a tough question to answer because I have a lot of favorite movies. I very, very, very much love movies and thinking about movies and you know analyzing movies the way you analyze literature and I just love movies a lot. Um, so I have kind of my classic like life time kind of answers like my two favorite movies I've always thought of as like my favorite movies over like my whole lifetime are Harold and Maude and The Sandlot. Uh, I'm kind of obsessed with coming of age things, movies, books, I love the coming of age story and The Sandlot is one of these movies that I've seen so many times that I can recite the whole movie as I'm watching it. And Harold and Maude is just, it, it's, it's a great movie. If you sit there and think about it and pick it apart, it's, it's a beautiful movie. I love what it represents. Kind of the things that, the themes that are in Harold and Maude are like kind of, embody what makes me feel like connected to that whole coming of age story. Like my obsession with like uh, growing into an adult and changing and learning. And it's just, it's a, it's, it's a really good movie. It's a really weird movie. It's kind of dark. Uh, it was made in the seventies. It's got Cat uh, Stevens as the entire soundtrack. And it's, it's, it's a movie that like really represents who I was in like my 20s. I love it. I love it. I love that movie so much. Uh, before I had ever seen it, I was in my early 20s and my friend Mark, hi Mark. Uh, if you're, Sarah, you watched maybe sometimes. So Mark, you might be watching too. Uh, he told me, he was surprised that I had never seen it. And so we went to the video store and got a VHS. Well, we went to the video store and grabbed the VHS copy of it and tried to rent it. Uh, and the video clerk was so cool. It was back in the early 2000s. So there were VHSs and DVDs. Uh, and the video clerk was like, so excited that we were renting Harold and Maude. 
And he was just like, you can't watch this on VHS. Like, you need to, you need to watch it on DVD. Like, you can't, you can't watch this great movie, like, on such terrible quality. And so he gave us the DVD for the VHS price. But anyway, the point of the story is that when Mark first wanted me to watch it, he told me, uh, you'll laugh and you'll cry. And you do. You laugh and you cry when you watch Harold and Mom. It's so good. My current favorite movie? I don't know, man. I, for the past, ever since I saw it, I've been kind of claiming that Patterson is like my current favorite movie. That is a Jim Jarmusch movie. Jim Jarmusch is a director that I adore. Hardcore. Down by Law is one of my other favorite movies. It's with Tom Waits. And <laughs> Patterson is with, I don't know this actor's name, but I deeply love him. He's the guy who was in the kind of the modern Star Wars movies as uh, Han Solo's son. Um, that guy, I love him. He's was also in this other, he's been in some really, he's an amazing actor, I love him so much. But anyway, he is in this movie and he plays a bus driver and a poet. And if Harold and Maude represented who I was in my 20s, I think Patterson kind of represents who I am now. And it's about the beauty and the art in mundanity. I think, that's how I interpret it. And I just love it. The, the, the touches in this movie are amazing. There's this one scene where this little girl writes a poem and they're in an alley and he's reading it and the poem is called Waterfalls and she makes sure that he knows. It's not waterfalls, like waterfalls. It's like waterfalls. I don't know. I, it's really good. If you're into like slow moving movies and you're okay with that kind of thing, it's, it's, I love it. I love that movie. It's like my kind of right now favorite movie. Um, I also really like The Hateful Eight. I also really, really love Quentin Tarantino, and I think The Hateful Eight is my um, current favorite Quentin Tarantino movie. I've seen it a couple times. I love westerns. Another whole favorite of mine is spaghetti westerns, and uh, The Good, The Bad, and the Ugly, and stuff like that, and Once Upon a Time in the West. And to me, that movie was such a good representation of some of my favorite types of westerns. I don't like, like, uh, what's his face? I don't like the classic American, like, 50s westerns with the, like, gunslinging and stuff. I don't like those. But I do like a certain kind of western a lot. And that movie, to me, represents the kind of western that I really love. And I loved that movie. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna stop talking about movies now. Jillian, you're gonna get me off on this thing. It's gonna make this video, like, half hour long. Do you like Christmas music? Jillian also asks. I do. I love Christmas music. I'm all about getting super into the Christmas spirit, like right around Christmas. Like, a couple weeks before Christmas, give me all the Christmas music. My favorite Christmas music is, I have two favorite Christmas songs, and they are not surprising because they are like the best Christmas songs ever and a lot of people love them. Mariah Carey's All I Want For Christmas Is You and uh, Wham's Last Christmas. Those are my two favorite Christmas songs, and I love them, and I will listen to them a lot this year. I I like classic Christmas music, like Christmas carols, and, you know, classic pop Christmas music, but I also really love modern pop Christmas music. One of my favorite things to listen to is the pop Christmas music stations. Love them. Okay. Jillian asked a few more questions. Thank you, Jillian. What are you most excited about moving forward with Moonstone Dieworks? Um, so a dream of mine with Moonstone Dyers for a long time is to uh, get a farm yarn line and it's not something that I see as possible. I've done a lot of research into it. I've talked to uh, people who could be connections for it, but it's something that's that would take a lot of time commitment, travel commitment, and money commitment and I don't have any of those things to spare right now. Uh, so that's my dream. My dream is to have one base that's like kind of an ever-changing like uh, custom spun kind of non-superwash 100% wool kind of base and I don't know when that'll ever happen <laughs> because I would need to put a lot of energy into it and like I said I don't have that energy to spare right now unfortunately but I would like to at someday at someday I would like to someday 
Next, sorry, I have a lot of questions. What's the most challenging aspect of running? I think this says of running a small business. I can't tell because Instagram cuts off some of the questions if they're too long and I don't know how to read them. Otherwise, I'm sure there's a way, but I don't know what it is. The most challenging aspect of running a small business to me is the uncertainty of it. <laughs> Um, like it's something that I love doing and it's something that I have parceled out pieces of my life for to dedicate to it um, but it's difficult to know if what I'm going to create in those in that time is gonna be received you know by customers um, like I could I could la di da die yarn all day and it would be wonderful and glorious, but I don't know if it would sell, honestly. Um, so to me, that's the most challenging part is the uncertainty of whether or not people are going to want what I make. And sometimes they don't. And that's okay. That's totally okay. Sometimes they do. Sometimes I dye something and people really like it and it sells really well and that's really amazing and wonderful and it feels really good to be able to make something that is so enjoyed by people but sometimes uh, I come up with a colorway and I dye it and it just doesn't sell that well and that's totally fine like I said but it's that uncertainty like I don't know if people are gonna want it or not it might just sit in my stock forever and no one ever wants it and that's a that can be a little like micro crushing <laughs> like it's not bad don't worry don't worry about me I'm fine. Uh, but I, I would say to me that's the most challenging aspect okay one last one what's your favorite co cocktail the Manhattan my favorite cocktail is definitely a Manhattan the Manhattan is rye whiskey sweet vermouth and Angostura bitters and a cherry uh, Luxardo cherry. They're very expensive, very fancy cherries, but they're not the regular bright red maraschino cherries. It's a delicious cocktail and I love it. I really love simple cocktails that are basic and not very sweet. Um, I also really love martinis. Um, I also really love margaritas. The basic three, two, one margarita. And I, there's this great Archer quote, Archer is a cartoon that I love. Something like, how hard is it to make a margarita? It's only four ingredients. I passionately feel that way about margaritas. I don't like the like tall margaritas where it's like, you, it's like a sweet and sour mixer and it's like full of like juice and water and sugar. And a margarita, I think, <laughs> should be uh, three parts tequila, two parts Grand Marnier or Contro or whatever. One part lime juice, salt rim, on the rocks. Okay, moving on. Um, Precious Meta wants to know, how did you find yourself trying potato on pizza? So I've always loved potatoes a lot. They've always been like a very favorite food of mine. I um, even eat them raw, and I've done so since I was a little kid. Not like a whole potato. I have done that. But, um, you know, you're slicing potatoes for fried potatoes or something. I will eat like five of those suckers. Um, so I've always loved potatoes. And I'm into the idea of potatoes in and on whatever I can squeeze them into. The first time they appeared on pizza for me was when I was in my early 20s and I lived in an apartment in Quartz Hill, which is in the Mojave Desert, which is in the AV in Southern California. And uh, I lived with... Um, my friend who is now my brother-in-law and uh we were really into uh getting frozen pizzas frozen cheese pizzas and then putting our own toppings on them to us that was like us being really good cooks so we would eat that like all the time frozen pizza and we put our own stuff on them my favorite ended up being potatoes we just tried a lot of stuff on pizzas. I mean, all, you know, really normal stuff on pizza, but still, um, I would, my favorite way to do it is to slice potatoes really thin, toss them in olive oil, put them on and let them bake like that. Um, sometimes I'll par saute them and put them on like that, but that's how I used to do it is I would just slice raw potatoes really thin, toss them in oil, put them on top, 
And that was my uh, first foray into it. Laughing C asks, have I saved any more cats? No, but okay, so if you watch Vlogtober, uh, there was a cat named Merlin that happened into my backyard. I got a weird feeling about it, so I called the number on his tag and just said, hey, your cat's in my backyard, just in case you happen to be missing your cat. And they were like, oh, yes, thank you, we are missing our cat, and they came and picked him up. And then Merlin kept coming around. And I was like, okay. And I kept an eye on it. And I was like, okay, this cat's fine. This cat's just a roamer. I think these people were just like trying to raise an indoor cat and it wasn't working. And Merlin still comes around. And uh, we hang out and he's nice and then he goes home. So, but no, I haven't saved any more cats other than that. Tabitha the cat not a witch wants to know how many hand knit sweaters are in your closet. Well, let me go count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and uh, there are probably four or five more that I don't ever wear anymore. 20. I'm gonna say 20. I'm going on 20. What's Lucy's favorite food at the moment? Spaghetti and meatballs. That was Nine Crafty 11. Katie Knits 158 wants to know how long have you been knitting and who taught you? I've been knitting uh, on and off since I was in my early 20s. My early 20s was a big part of my life. I talk about it a lot. <laughs> so I'm 36 now, so I would say about 15 years on and off. Um, I uh, mostly taught myself how to knit, but the basics came from a friend of mine. So the origin story for knitting is that I was living in that same apartment. My roommate uh, was my now brother-in-law and also a friend of mine named Sarah. Actually, this might have been the time. I had a few roommates at that apartment. And uh, at the time, I think Sarah and her then husband might have been my roommates. But anyway... So we hung out a lot. A lot of people, a lot of our kind of like friend group hung out at our apartment. Um, and so we did a lot of hanging out just at night, like late into the night, sitting on the couch, hanging out, doing nothing. And uh, one night, late at night, I don't know why, we decided, like me and Sarah and I think probably just us two decided we wanted to learn how to knit. I don't know where it came from. Uh, my Our friend Ruth, uh, knew how to knit, so she was like, I'll teach you guys how to knit. We didn't have any knitting supplies though, so we uh, got in my car and drove to Walmart, which was open 24 hours, and bought needles and yarn. And then we went home and she taught us how to knit. And that sparked this um, uh, short-lived obsession of ours. It started with me and Sarah and Ruth knitting and then it kind of like bloomed out into other members of our friend group. A lot of scarves got knit for in a short period of time and they were all that like um, yarn you would get at Michael's and Walmart that's like really thick puffy boucle yarn that was like black and neon colors and stuff like that. Uh, and we would always kind of do the same thing, like at least my scarves were really long and, you know, yay wide, and they'd be striped, like black neon, black neon. And a lot of scarves like that got made. I don't have mine anymore, my husband made one at that time, and he still has his. I will show you, I'm gonna get it. This is a fantastic representation of the kind of scarves we used to knit. This is the one Colin knit back then, and it's just garter. It always had fringe. <laughs> um, and from there, um, it was a short-lived phenomenon. And then I just had some supplies that I always kept around. I would say pretty much every Christmas, I'd get back into it for a little bit. Um, this was before Ravelry. And so I would get library books and stuff like that. And knitting patterns back then, like from the books I was reading, were not nearly as good as the ones that are around now on Ravelry. Independent knitting pattern publishing, I feel like, has done so much good for knitting. 
like really <laughs> um so i you know i learned to follow patterns back then sometimes too but they you know i never made anything that great i don't have anything still from that era of knitting i think most of it were, were gifts i would knit a lot as christmas gifts that's why i would do it like every christmas um a lot of scarves and uh then when i became a knitter with a capital k if you know what i mean uh it was in 2012 i got a ravelry i got on ravelry in the early days i think in like 2009 or 10 but then i don't know if you remember ravelry had like a security breach and like you know that happens to online companies sometimes and so they sent out an email and it was when i was just kind of on and off knitting so i was like oh forget this so i like deleted my ravelry account and then i get back on i got back on in 2012 and that's when i first started watching the knit girls and i remember it was after I moved here to Northern California, uh, it was, I was sick and so I had to call in sick to work and I don't know how I discovered the Knit Girls, but I did. It was right around Christmas time, so I was like in a knitting thing. I discovered the Knit Girls, I started watching them, I became obsessed, I watched them all day long and from there, knitting podcast happened and Ravelry re-happened and my current journey in knitting happened. So that kind of knitting, it's been seven years. Wow, that's a long time. But um, yeah, so seven years knitting, knitting, and about 15 years kind of knitting. Samantha Irene, sorry, your name got cut off. Uh, what made you decide to raise chickens? Do you have neighborhood cats? Do the neighborhood cats ever bother them? I've always wanted to have livestock. Uh, it's like one of my dreams to have like a little ranch or something. Like kind of Joanna of Knitspin Farm is living my dream life. I'm sure it's hard, but uh, I, she's got like property and a cool old farmhouse and she's got a bunch of animals and she does farmers markets and dyes yarn and she is so awesome and I love her uh and I've always kind of wanted that lifestyle uh and I don't have it right now which is fine but the one livestock animal that I can easily have in a neighborhood in a residential neighborhood where I live are chickens so as soon as I stopped living in an apartment and my, got my first rental house rather than rental apartment that had a backyard. I was like, I'm getting chickens because I can have something back here. So we got chickens and we've had them ever since. And once we bought this house that we live in now, we built a new coop, got a new setup, and I love having chickens. I love having animals around and I love having fresh, super delicious eggs every day. And the neighborhood cats don't bother them. They love them. I, you can at any random time find a neighborhood cat sitting on top of their coop, but they always just kind of look at them. The worst anybody's ever done is that time Merlin tried to attack him, and you saw that in October. <laughs> but he just kind of ran at them from outside of their little fence. But no, I mean, cats like chickens, but I haven't ever encountered any cat at really attacking my chickens. So that's good. If a dog ever got into my backyard and like had access to them, I'm pretty sure that would be bad, but um, yeah, cats are fine. The Yarn Fashionista wants to know what made you start an indie yarn business? I really wanted to dye yarn. It looked like so much fun. And I, like I said before, I tried it. I fell in love with it. Um, I really like, I'm not a great artist. I don't have that great of creative mind. But if you give me a freeform canvas like yarn and color and I'm able to layer and do it until I like where I'm at, I work really well that way. I love creativity, but uh, I found that dyeing yarn is, an, is a creative outlet that really meshes with the way my mind works. And I really enjoy it and I love it. And kind of the natural next step to after you start dyeing yarn is to try and sell it because I you dye too much yarn and you can't use it all. <laughs> so you want a little help in that department. Proudfoot K asks, do I have a go-to non-vanilla sock pattern? Advice if someone is in a knitting slump. Thanks. Uh, so the only two I think, kind of, non-vanilla sock patterns I've made are Hermione's Everyday, Everyday Sock and the Blueberry Waffle Socks. And um, 
There was another one. Wasn't there? Oh, I also made The Town of Socks by Becky Sorensen. And I feel like there was another one too. Um, I would say that Hermione's Everyday Sock is my favorite. I've only made it once, but I really like how it fits. Uh, I really, the, the knit pearl pattern was really um, non-annoying, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, so that's the one that I guess is my go-to, even though I've only made it once. Because I've only ever made any textured sock pattern once. <laughs> um, and... As for knitting slumps, I definitely go through them. And I went through one pretty recently. It might always tend to be a little existential. Like, I go through these short periods of time where I'm like, why do I even knit? Like, what's the point? What am I, is this just a big waste of time? <laughs> and usually, the way I get through a knitting slump is I just uh, roll with it. And I allow myself to not knit until something usually it comes back to me naturally and it's usually because of some inspiration um you know whether it be like a knitting podcast that I'm watching that's getting me really excited about it or you know even when I'm not knitting because I'm in a slump I will still browse Ravelry it's one of my favorite things to do and you know something will pop out of me and I'll want to knit it or like an idea, a set of ideas that I want to make will start building up in my head and I'll want to get into it. Um, so I think my advice for knitting slumps is don't force it. Don't make your, don't try and make yourself work on things you don't feel like working on. Um, I tend to do best if I just let the knitting slump wash over me and eventually it will wash away. Purdy Lane wants to know, when do you find time to knit? Any tips for new? Ah! Am I just like lame and I don't know how to use Instagram? What does this say? When do you find time to knit? Any tips for new? Mamas! It says mamas. <laughs> um, so I knit while Lucy naps, uh, and I know naps for new mamas can be a very difficult and contentious time. It was for me for a long time. And then Lucy finally, I taught her, she learned how to sleep on her own. For a long time, she couldn't, she didn't know how to sleep on her own. So she was sleeping in my arms and I could not knit while she was sleeping and it sucked. And so for the first few months of her life, I got hardly any knitting done because newborn life is absolutely a hazy blur of panic. <laughs> At least it was for me. Um, yeah, so for really new mamas, I don't know what to tell you. It's different for everybody. For me, it was not in the cards. I did not hardly knit at all. I was like, constantly had to hold her. She was constantly nursing. We had nursing issues, so she was constantly attached to me. And, uh, and then at night, I would nurse her to sleep and then fall asleep myself. Sometimes it would take her till like midnight to actually fall asleep. And then I had to hope she stayed asleep as I put her down. And then I would finally pass out. Uh, but then eventually, it, it did get better the way everybody said it would. Things started to normalize. And for me, the first step was when I was finally able to stay up later than her. One night... I was just like, I put her down to bed and it was nine. And I was like, oh, maybe I should stay up a little bit. <laughs> so I like snuck out to the living room and I hung out for like an hour before going to bed myself. And that eventually, you know, morphed into the routine that we're in now where she goes to bed at seven, I leave and I go do my thing until I go to bed. Uh, but yeah, knitting at night after she went to bed, when I could finally stay up later than her was a really big deal to me. That's where my knitting time started to come back to me as a mom. Um, and now, uh, my knitting time falls definitely when she's napping. A lot of times while she's napping, that's when I knit. And also after she goes to bed. And I mean, another part of it is just that like, that's what I do with my time. Like, you know, after she goes to bed, I'm not like, I don't know. I'm, I'm sitting in front of the TV knitting. It's a couch potato thing. So, <laughs> um, 
and yeah, I don't knit when she's awake really because it's just she's not the kind of kid that would just let me do that. She'll want to she'll want to know what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, so sleeping, which I know is super tough because not all babies um or kids even, not all kids sleep to where you can do other things while they sleep. Uh, I am lucky and Lucy is good at it right now. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. This is very long. I am very sorry that this is such a long Vlogmas episode, but they will not all be like that. Uh, now I am going to go dye my yarn. I had planned to do it much earlier than this. I didn't realize this would take so long, but I, I can talk sometimes for a really long time. So I'm off to do some Christmas colorway dyeing and I will probably just see you guys tomorrow because I'm not going to add any more stuff because this is already way too long. Okay, love you guys. Bye!